Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is always with us, the God of love and mercy, the God of compassion, who knows each one of us, who called us by name, and who will never leave and forsake us. Today our Gospel reading will be from Luke 11. Let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we can be together and that we can learn again from your word. The words that is captured for us in the Bible to guide and lead and direct us in this life, to help us even in times of trouble. Open our minds and our hearts that we will be able to receive the message Apply that to our lives and be filled with hope. In Jesus' name, Amen. The theme today before us is captured within our reading. It was a request from one of the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. So that is our theme for today. Lord, teach us to pray. The reading from Luke 11, starting at verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, And he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give his him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We read up to here and praise God for the word before us. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. This is a quote from an from Albert Einstein. He shared these words of advice with his son in a letter dated the 5th of February 1930. Wise words that must have been a blessing and deeply meaningful then, but also meaningful to many others over the years. Wise words based on logic. We might bring years of experience to the table when we discuss prayer. 
or when we debate about the content of prayer. But then, I cannot help asking, is our experience really what is needed? Is it maybe not time to just sit down and get back to basics? It could be that we assume, think, that prayer is like riding a bicycle. We've done it for so long that we think we know how to do it. And we feel confident that there isn't really difficulty to pray. But saying this, I'm also reminded about so many who shared that there are times when it feels as if their prayers barely reach the ceiling. I can relate to this, although it is just our own perception when we say that. This should also not be a problem, because God hear and receive our praise as we utter them in our hearts, with no distance that it needs to travel before it reach God. Because God, the God we love, the God who love us unconditionally, is within us. And that's why there is no distance needed to travel. One theologian and teacher that I really enjoy is John Piper. And his teaching on prayer is helpful and capturing the heart of prayer. Jesus is sharing this well-known prayer in response to a request from one disciple. We saw that in verse 2. And then Jesus responded. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. From this we see, firstly, that prayer is God-centered, as the first word is addressing God the Father, following with asking for His name, to be worshipped and glorified. How might the question be? How can this be put in place? How can we make sure that this is correctly done? By God working in people's hearts in a way that they will respond by glorifying His name. That is the request right in the beginning of this prayer. This way of starting our prayers should always be part of our prayers as Jesus directed in saying, when you pray. It is as if it is seen as the norm, when you pray. So it is every time we pray and whenever we pray, we express the desire or the wish for God, or the name of God, to be valued more. Valued in our own hearts, in the church, and in the world. It is a prayer for passion for God, and then for God to be glorified. It is also important to remember what is said in Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. This forms the foundation of another lesson that Jesus built into the teaching of prayer. It is addressed in verse 4, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. It is not perfect people that receive God's attention. God hear and answer the prayers of penitent sinners. This should motivate us to really search our hearts for any wickedness, wickedness, to confess it before God as we start our prayers. 
So in going back to the beginning of what Jesus said, we could read, when you pray, forgive us our sins. When you pray, say, forgive us our sins. It should be in every prayer that we as imperfect people acknowledge that we are sinners, sinners in need for his forgiveness and kingdom restoration in our lives. As Martin Luther said on his deathbed, we are beggars, this is true. Jesus says in verse 13 that the disciples are evil, this is a very strong accusation, but is not saying that they are out of fellowship with him and that their prayers could not be answered. But it does place emphasis on our sinful human nature. With the potential for both, we are equally good and bad because of our sinful nature and imperfections. We are gradually overcoming our evil side by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize this and we need to fight sin. We need to cling to the cross of Christ as our hope. God will hear us and answer our prayers. Another important lesson is captured for us in verse 11 to 13. Jesus is saying that even with our sinful nature and imperfections, our human fathers will know, the res know to respond to the needs of their children. How much more then will God the Father, God the Father who is perfect and loving, listen and respond to his children in a time of need and know not to add evil and suffering to their lives? but for provide for them and protect them. If you then, verse 13, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? As perfect Father, he will always give to us that which is good for us, even if we do not understand why that which we receive is the best for us. Provided by his wisdom and love, we will only receive that which is good. What this world and the worldly system provides is not from God and not the best. He won for us. This is why another line in Jesus' prayer is also important. This line prays for the restoration and transformation of our current situation of suffering, difficulty and distress. It is captured in verse 2. Your kingdom come. These three words cancel what we receive in the reality of this world. Be it trouble, trouble of in the relationships, or lack of skill, or wisdom, or maybe ill health that we suffer. None of these are from God, but can be changed and transformed by the power of God. We need to open ourselves to the presence of God. We need to invite Him into our reality, and then... Be guided by the Holy Spirit. Allow the change to happen. With faith and expectation, let us continue in prayer and proclaim the power of prayer and allow God to bring that deeply needed and important change that will restore our joy and our peace. Amen. Father God, you are the pre-dawn glow that promises yet another new beginning. 
You are the still dusk that brings rest to the weary world. You are the prophecy of God's life-giving word inscribed on our hearts. You are the law that finds its fulfillment in love. You are the mountain where the presence of God blazes and burns. You are the valley where the face of God peeks out from suffering eyes. You are the glory that we long for, the whispered rumor of a different order, the shining one who transfigures all things. You are the one we worship. Amen.